lot of good quality of visitors. We, you know, we met a lot of people where we got some real value addition to our business. Such a beautiful event, such a wonderful event. It has been able to help all the stakeholders to come on one platform. The all professionals in the field, be it airlines, airports, GSAs, IT companies. So they all come on one platform, which has really helped all of us. It's a very good uh, thing to happen for India because you meet new people, you get to know ideas, you know, you understand thoughts of other people, you plan yourself for the future. So I would say that uh, these kind of networking platforms are very important for our business growth. It has forwarders, it has airports, it has agents, it has airlines. So a lot of experience sharing we, we gain from this uh, conference. Great panel team, I must say. Very, very interesting people and some very high quality people. It's a pleasure and an honor to be part of those panels. Meetings at these kind of conferences is what keeps the business going and where most of the business is actually done. Thank, right. you, thank you, Edmund, for uh, the wonderful video. Uh, I would uh, once again welcome all the uh, panelists uh, to this wonderful webinar. Uh, and thank you very much for taking out your uh, precious time to speak to us and to discuss the issue of the future wars between air and sea that we would uh, like to understand and see what is the outcome of this entire discussion. Uh, over to Mr. Stephen Pullman, who is our moderator for today's webinar. Thank you very much, Stephen. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tarun. Uh, the benefit of meeting each other during, for example, Air Cargo India is that we can say to each other physically good morning, good afternoon or good evening, uh, depending on the time of the day, because we are all in the same time zone in this new normal where we are connecting digitally. I have no idea if you just had breakfast or you are waiting for your dinner. So I'm going to make it easy to myself and I'm just going to welcome everybody and say good day to everybody. We have a, a set of uh, very well-known uh, speakers. Uh, the benefit today, and which is a nice change for me too, it's both air and ocean. And I think that could be a, a nice uh, different view uh, on, on the current situation. Um, I will ask the panelists uh, to introduce themselves. I think they can do that better than I can, despite me having a lot of details on them. But then it's up to them to choose what they say or do not say. Uh, I am uh, uh, chairman of TIACA and the director of cargo and logistics of Brussels Airport, but I will try to avoid speaking too much and leave the word to the different panelists, asking them all one by one to introduce themselves, but also give them already uh, the, to the speakers to the audience, a high level view on, on how they see the current situation uh, and the biggest trends and impact you are seeing on, on your part of the, uh, of the industry. Um, so Mr. Tanush, if you could start uh, by introducing and giving your views, please. Hi, uh, good day to everyone. Uh, so I actually work for Indian Ports Association as Assistant Director Strategic Management. So Indian Port Association is actually an apex body for all the major ports of India. When I say major ports, there are 12 major ports in India which come direct under the control of Central Government Ministry of Shipping. And uh, with respect to uh, my assessment of the current situation, 
okay i'll stop with the introduction for now uh, or should we should i uh, proceed further or wait for the other panelist for the introduction no you can already give your first uh, first assessment okay. of the situation yeah sure so uh, as i was saying like uh, every other sector uh, operations of maritime sector including shipping companies and related industries uh, like terminal ports etc have been affected very severely uh, during this covid crisis and i think the traffic volume handled at ports will be a good indicator in understanding the impact on overall economy especially for a country like india uh, as the exim uh merchandise trade of india from 90 to 95% by volume is done by waterways uh, and 80% of value is done by waterways so uh, major ports actually handle 55% of the total traffic handled at the indian ports so as uh, the total traffic uh, for the last uh, finance year that is 1920 was 704 uh, million ton short of the target and we recorded the growth of only 0.82% as compared to the 3% in the last financial year even the number of vessels uh, that has been handled at the major ports have dropped by 0.08% and if we just uh, look at the uh, some figures from the last 5 months uh, Uh, growth had had already started declining since december when the corona virus impact was mostly limited to china and many ports in china were shutting down in december the growth rate was already uh, below uh, 6% by january it had gone below 2% by march when uh, the corona virus crisis started hitting india the growth was uh, rate was becoming negative and we recorded minus 5.25% drop in the cargo traffic at the major ports and by april the total drop in the cargo traffic handled vis a vis april in 2019 was minus 21.08% and if i say in terms of the containers volume there was a drop of 37% in the containers handled at the major ports so from all these figures we can very clearly gauge the impact of covid-19 on the shipping sector and port sector particularly with respect to the country like india thank you thank you very much mr satish could you please uh, continue okay uh for us as uh, agility as an organization uh, we probably were a little more prepared in terms of uh, covid-19 and uh, because we had the opportunity that what we learned out from our colleagues in china uh, we could probably get be a little more proactive in terms of what we could do uh, there is surely an impact on the business which goes beyond saying i think my uh, fellow panelist Tanu touched upon the ocean freight, and definitely the impact of the ocean freight can see across uh, all verticals, uh, not referring specifically to one, uh, whether it's uh, the retail, automotive, or any one of them. Uh, we've basically seen that with all the capacity constraints and the rest things that have come in, uh, four or five important aspects that uh, have come through for us so far is that. the importance of people to the organizations how important critically people are now for every one of us uh, safety of all the people uh, was another area which you know we could uh, really focus upon and uh, you know we we seeing uh, really challenging times uh, in terms of uh, you know how you have to realign yourself into the new environment so i think it it's quite a bit of thing in terms of learning for us uh, while the volumes are dropping uh, substantially because of capacity constraints in air as well as uh, no production happening and uh, several other factors but i think as we progress in the conference i can share with you as to what uh, we been able to do as an organization as well uh, to help the current scenario so that's my opening remarks uh, steven Okay thank you very much and then I'll uh, give the word to Mr Turan Thank you Steven uh, first I would like to uh, thank you uh, for to the organization uh, and I feel very uh, excited and privileged to be here to have chance to listen to you all very very valuable participants uh, and also to have chance to uh, share uh, my opinions so thank you very much Uh, to introduce myself i am the chief cargo officer of turkish airlines so i am 
the person who, who is heading and fully in charge of Turkish cargo business and the brand. Turkish cargo is a business unit, a air logistics business unit of Turkish Airlines. And uh, I am uh, managing uh, in this role, reporting directly to CEO of uh, Turkish Airlines since now four years. Before joining to uh, Turkish Airlines as the head of uh, cargo, I worked in uh, several uh, logistics positions in automotive sector uh, in the first party and uh, several 3, 3PL and forwarding and express uh, global organizations. So I may say that I am a, a supply chain and logistics professional and executive rather than mainly uh, being specific to uh, air cargo industry. Uh, so that's my instruction and um, introduction and uh, related to assessment of the station. So I believe uh, the battle between uh, sea and air is a, a nice phrase to uh, pull the attention yeah, of the people. But we, uh, all, all the part participants, I'm sure uh, we take this, uh, that uh, the supply chain has always uh, coming and goings and uh, fluctuations, let me say. So sea, air, ground, and all air transportation modes are indeed coexisting uh, in the best uh, interest of the uh, of people and enterprises eventually. However, uh, that's certain that since this COVID-19 crisis took over first to China and then the rest of the world, uh, we, not only us as supply chain uh, executives and professionals, but all the world, I believe, understood the importance of total supply chain, supply chain management and logistics, because now it impacts uh, to the life of people, threat to the life of people, it impacts directly to the capability and ability of uh, medical sectors and hospitals and doctors and all the uh, medical workers impact to uh, recover the situation is mainly depending on the uh, flow of the uh, pharma and medical equipment and materials. So from that perspective, I believe uh, whole communities now understands uh, better uh, the, uh, the importance of supply chain. Obviously, if I need to look more closely from air cargo uh, industry and uh, air cargo carrier perspective as the head of Turkish cargo, I should say that uh, this is eventually uh, very, very bad and very, very good at the same time, which is the result of this disruption. It's very, very bad because the industry is eventually based on passenger and cargo flying together in terms of cost, in terms of service, in terms of network coverage, uh, all the capability of airlines and the best is do, the best who are doing this for the passengers and for the cargo are the ones who are carrying the best amount of cargo in their belly hold capacity of the passenger planes. That's why when uh, gradually during uh, February and March and early April, uh, the flights of uh, passenger planes uh, start to shrink down, it was a huge uh, supply and capacity uh, crisis, supply and capacity uh, trauma into the sector. We suddenly lost 50% uh, of our capacity. And for the airlines who have much less investment into the uh, freighters and cargo freighters should have even more capacity losses. Uh, that's why uh, it became much more important to operate and uh, meet the needs and requirements of uh, our customers, uh, our normal standard customers, as well as all the uh, urgent and harsh shipments, especially in uh, medical sectors, became much more challenging, much more important and challenging uh, to fulfill on time. So we as uh, all uh, in general and specifically as uh, airlines and air cargo uh, professionals, I believe uh, we live throughout the months, maybe a year or so, 
maybe the most difficult, also the most important times of the industry, as far as I can see in the uh, last several decades. Uh, the comeback of uh, passenger uh, demand uh, is obviously not very certain. However, most of the expectations and predictions are uh, considering a gradual comeback. So the level of passenger demand to reach pre-pandemic conditions is expected to reach up to two, three, or even further years because of the uh, trauma that we all as human beings now uh, worrying about sitting very close to unknown uh, people, even though that would have certainly a lot of new regulations uh, sustaining uh, in order to enable uh, the passenger health uh, protection at worst, at best. However, uh, the demand of passenger uh, will be gradually coming in a short, longer period, which will make air cargo, again, uh, in a very, very difficult uh, and also challenging conditions uh, compared with the uh, uh, pre-pandemic conditions, which I believe we all as the sector uh, and the stakeholders uh, should work together. Since we did in the last two, three months, I believe we did a quite a good job to show how we can operate under such uh, challenging conditions and meet the demand of uh, very, very critical sectors, uh, especially uh, medical sectors. Uh, and we should continue to keep on this. And uh, sorry, I, I had forgot, but I need to say in my uh, self uh, instruction, I am also a proud member of TIAKA board. I need to say this. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for the last comment. Uh, <laughs> I'll note that down as well. Sorry, Thanks, I, I, I forgot. <laughs> I, I need to say in the beginning, I am a TIAKA okay. board member and very, very <laughs> proud to be there. Okay, uh, and for those of you who might be a little bit worried about my health condition, because I look a little bit blue on the screen, I can assure you I'm in perfect good condition. I'm also not changing in, uh, in this famous Belgian uh, comics, the uh, Smurf, but I'm just having a two white office and a white shirt, and that is not helping with this background, but everything safe. Uh, I believe that um, Mr. Fitzum is not yet on the panel, so I will, I will continue. To make this uh, as interactive as possible, we have a few questions for all of you to answer so that we can have an interactive discussion and a poll. So I would like to ask the organization to launch the first question, please. Yes, please. Yes, Mr. Steven, it's up on the screen. Yeah, perfect. So it's an easy question. Do you think there's going to be a winner after this crisis? Uh, which mode of transport will emerge stronger than the other ones? Uh, and again, there might be fewer answers, but what do you think fits most your, um, your choice? Right, uh, 15 seconds more. Uh, we close it. Okay. Yes, here are the results. Uh, that's an interesting one. So from the respondents, 42% believe that the airways will come out of this crisis as a winner, um, which might uh, be a bit of contradictionary to what Mr. Turan just said about aviation in general needing a few years to recover. Uh, and of course, like, like we said, uh, air cargo is very much linked to, uh, to the aviation in general. Turan, if you see this outcome, what is your first reaction? Uh, I mean, it's natural if you look in the uh, short term perspective, uh, the uh, urgent need of uh, medical supplies made uh, air, uh, airways and air lines in general uh, air cargoes uh, to play more critical roles. Many uh, traditionally uh, seaway or uh, road or railway uh, cargoes have shifted to uh, airways uh, just because of urgency uh, requirements uh, due to the pandemic. However, we shall 
consider this as a short term impact due to the supply chain disruptions and due to the demand changes. First of all, all the modes of uh, transportation within logistics are complementary. We should, uh, I'm sure, all agree about it. Related to the cost, related to uh, temp uh, condition, and related to speed requirements, uh, our customers uh, had changed, had, motiv uh, had um, shared their, let's say, uh, demand uh, within different modes. And in the future, they will do the same. Uh, they will never uh, uh, have uh, one uh, mode be very, very favorable versus the other. Uh, in this favor of air cargo, uh, I think we should all uh, consider uh, the impact of uh, cost base increase in air cargo. It's not hundred percent. It's not very clear how much will it be. However, if the passenger do not fly, or if the passenger flies much less than it is, which means if the passenger planes uh, belly capacity in the skies are less than uh, pre-pandemic conditions, air cargo cannot sustain the cost base of the pre-pandemic conditions. We should all agree. Because currently all these uh, additional demand are uh, urgent demand, the price sensitivity is less and everyone just fly, wants to fly their cargo. But if we expect a two to three years post pandemic stabilized environment where passenger demand is less than pre pandemic, but very slowly uh, improving, then we should expect significantly higher uh, air cargo cost, air transportation cost than compar comparatively than uh, other modes. Then it will impact the demand of our customers to shift more to seaway or any other uh, ground uh, modes just because of the cost difference will even increase further. That's my expectation. Obviously, it's very difficult to estimate how much this impact will be, but I am pretty sure that this will be an impact more or less. Yeah, okay, thank you very much, Turan. And, and this was one of the questions already uh, in, from, from, the, from the audience. So, in your opinion, in the next few years, we will need to take uh, in mind that there will be a structural higher cost for air cargo due to the, the lack of capacity, uh, mainly uh, due to less passengers flying and, and less belly capacity. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Tanush, from, from the sea uh, or, or from the waterways uh, point of view, uh, there is no lack of capacity. I think that your, your problem today with the volumes going down is more linked to the economy uh, in general and production being lower. Uh, how do you see recovery in, in, the, in the weeks and months to come? And do you see any price effect on the waterways um, because capacity is there, lower volumes. Do you see a different trend than in air cargo? Uh, yes, even uh, as you uh, rightly said, uh, for example, right now, uh, the capacity utilization of Indian ports, so pre-COVID capacity utilization were nearly uh, between some 55 to 60%. So we are not short of capacity at all. Of course, the crisis has uh, impacted the financials of the ports very severely. Uh, there are several reasons for that. One is, as you said, the drop in cargo. Then there have been certain government directives uh, to the major ports, especially uh, not to levy any penal charges, demurrages charges uh, to the port users in order to uh, kind of give a relief to the trade and the manufacturers of the country. So uh, what I see that once the situation normalizes, uh, there could be some escalation in traffic to recover those losses. Uh, that will not be immediate, uh, but yes, again, that will also depend on the overall industry response and the market competition. And once that happens, that will obviously have impact on the freight, uh, freight transportation as well. And one uh, remark I also wanted to uh, make on the previous uh, comment that was made by uh, Mr. Turhat, 
uh, related to the shift in the cargo. I, I think uh, in the coming days, uh, the, once the situation become more uh, normal, and as uh, we have seen during uh, this crisis that people are getting more environmental, uh, you know, aware, and uh, we, we, they are seeing the change in the environment around them, especially in the country uh, like India. So there would be uh, air transport maybe, uh, you know, facing some competition uh, from the railways because uh, when I say that there would be a push, a greater push uh, in the uh, railway transportation in the form of high speed transportation such as um, uh, what you call that uh, Hyperloop cargo and all as they all offer uh, to shift the cargo at the price of road transportation with the speed of uh, uh, air, aircraft transportation. And there will, uh, in the short term, I don't see anyone gaining out of this crisis. There will be no winners. But in the long run, I see uh, more and more uh, traffic shifting towards the waterways, being the greener and cheaper mode of the transportation. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Uh, interesting. And we have a question on that later on. So we will come back on the topic of the environment. Uh, Mr. Satish, as a, as a freight forwarder, uh, I think you have a very good view on both uh, modes of transport because as a, as a logistics architect, you use both. If you see the, uh, the capacity that is available on the waterways and the, the temporarily higher cost and capacity shortage uh, on the aviation part, how do you see the trend? Who, who do you think will benefit most or do you see significant changes in the, in the near future? You're still on mute. Sorry, Mr. Satish, you're on mute. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting question to answer for a reason is that uh, from what Tanuj mentioned and what Mr. Turan mentioned, uh, the situation as far as India is concerned, uh, we have seen a quite a bit of blank sailings, which means that the containers are uh, not sailing as per schedule, given the fact that you don't have production happening to the scale to really manufacture so much that it can go by ocean. Also, even if it is ready to go by ocean, uh, with four blank sailings, you have a one month delay in the ocean freight, which is ultimately forcing the customers currently to look at air freight options. On the air side, on the contrary, the capacity is almost dropped uh, to, a, I would say that the current capacity out of India is restricted to three major carriers, Turkish, uh, Emirates and Qatar, leaving, uh, you know, some routes really uh, skyrocketing to prices which uh, have, we have never seen. But the shippers have no other op obligation because these are life-saving drugs on one side. For the last one month, uh, we have not shipped uh, any cargo other than pharma. The reality is that. So the pharma is able to afford the price at this point of time. But now that the lockdown has you know, eased to a larger extent, Ocean is expected to be back and uh, we are already seeing the first seven days of the month uh, showing trends of a few export containers getting out. So the answer is that, look, air is uh, a reality that is happening now. Ocean is something which we want to do to bring down the cost, but the circumstances are not permitting us at this point of time to look at even ocean containers because uh, the interstate uh, movements within the country also have not been so easy because landlocked cities like uh, Hyderabad or say Madhya Pradesh and rest of them have uh, difficulty. They don't have any seaports and they are highly dependent on connectivity on the roadways. And there is an acute shortage of trucks and drivers as well to get the containers to the factories. So overall scenario is that at this point of time, majority of the goods are going by air, but we are hopeful that, you know, in the coming days, we will see some light to reduce the cost and some part of cargo even going by ocean. So th those will be the current operations that we are seeing, Stephen. Yeah, thank you very much. And maybe a follow-on question for you based on what Mr. Turan said earlier, and which I, I, by the way, fully support. When we talk about air and ocean, it's more about coexistence. We are two modes of transport that I think are, are living more or less next to each other uh, with uh, very different uh, um, um, basics. Um, do you see more eh, as a freight forwarder if, if we see the different modes of transport? Do you indeed see that the battle is not between, between air and ocean, but maybe between air and road, and maybe even between 
ocean and, and, and railways or air and railways? How do you see it or how do you look at it for the future? Okay, the, the question is back to me, Stephen. Yes, please. Okay, perfect. Uh, in India, if you look at it, uh, I'll be specific more to India for a reason. Uh, let me touch upon railways. Uh, railways has been always predominantly used for commodities like coal and uh, other commodities which uh, were being used by rail. And the ocean freight containers movement uh, that has been happening across the country, uh, rail has been a predominant uh, factor in which we've been using it. And that will continue to dominate and uh, rail had no restrictions uh, for cargo. I know the passenger trains have stopped, but that has not impacted uh, really the container movement. And what government has done as conquer is that uh, they have uh, really stepped in and allowed repositioning of containers at free of cost to inland container stations and depots, which has actually a good step to encourage people to use the uh, container mode of transport. We've been in touch with uh, the senior authorities of uh, for all the inland container yeah. Now, in respect to road movement, like I mentioned in the past also, it has not been an easy uh, for the first few months, but honestly, it has eased out now. Government has stepped in. Uh, they have gone to the extent of, you know, uh, making sure that the police are informed now about sensitivizing of allowing the trucks to move. Uh, larger measures have happened. Interstate, there are certain issues, but overall there has been an improvement in the last 40 days as far as road movement is concerned. So to everyone's benefit, I think rail and road is really a good movement at this point of time because the domestic air cargo has come to a stand. Let's accept the reality that the domestic air cargo in India, barring uh, a few operators, we really don't see that happening to a large extent for the first half of the year. And even as of today, we don't have clarity on from DGCA whether the domestic airlines will start to operate in full fledged or will they not operate in full fledged. If they operate, how much will they be able to carry? Because the belly capacity on a 737 aircraft, even if there is no baggage, is not more than three tons. And and this is a reality that we need to accept. Uh, that India unfortunately also doesn't have any wide bodies operating even after so many years that we have got into aviation uh, and the national carrier unfortunately does not have uh, operate heavily in the domestic sector. So, so the domestic cargo is going to surely have this uh, difficulty of the prices being out of the roof uh, for a couple more months. Yeah, ocean okay. freight uh, has always been a benefit. The pricing on ocean freight uh, has not been a challenge as far as ocean freight. But what India is facing as a major challenge today is an uh, inland haulages between landlocked uh, cities like Delhi to bringing it into uh, Navasheva like a port. I think that is where the cost is a very substantial factor. Uh, the cost of the ocean freight is still much lower because if you, if you look at a 20 feet container or a 40 feet container, the amount of cargo it can take to the ocean freight, the per kilo rate translates to a much lower amount. I think th these are my uh, clear candid comments on uh, your question on who is going to be benefited out of it. But I think we have a lot of constraints and challenges at this point of time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Before we go to the next poll, Mr. Turan, um, we, we are working in a, in a world that's bit by bit. We were working more digital, uh, getting used to uh, online meetings. Suddenly, thanks to COVID, we are all forced to work in a digital way. <laughs> And suddenly we are doing in two weeks what was taking normally years. Do you think that uh, due to the struggle we have in the air cargo business and in aviation in general, do you think that railways will be able to use this momentum to also put them in the market much stronger and faster and that the process that was going to take years is suddenly going to speed up and make them really there forever? Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, I think it's a very good question. It certainly uh, would have different uh, uh, developments uh, in different uh, countries. Uh, uh, so when I look from, for example, uh, Turkey or uh, European uh, market, uh, there, is, there are lots of uh, disruption in typical uh, road uh, transportation. And here, the most 
important alternative is railway because uh, air is uh, dominantly uh, significantly expensive. So for the typical road transportation uh, requirements, uh, unless it is very, very urgent and very small shares, air is not an uh, option uh, for several sectors. So uh, when I look to Europe from my angle and also from, for example, Turkish exports and imports into Europe and vice versa, uh, railway became a, a lot of uh, importance. Obviously, uh, India should have or might have uh, different dynamics. Uh, our Indian fellows uh, will tap on uh, much uh, precisely than myself. Uh, but uh, looking from uh, air uh, sector perspective and air cargo perspective, I believe uh, in the mid term, uh, although it, though it was coming, but it will accelerate the impact of Trans-Siberian uh, Railway lane uh, between uh, China and main export, uh, export ports of China, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and others. Central Europe and Western Europe uh, will be impacted further in terms of uh, positive development. So I expect more uh, demand for the railways, which is a very uh, in, in between ocean, sea, and air in the typical uh, Asia to Europe or Europe to Asia traffic. Uh, maybe for India, it is a little bit uh, well preserved against this uh, uh, being in the southern part. However, for the many uh, exporters and importer customers in Europe and in China, for this Europe to Asia and Asia to Europe traffic, uh, now uh, between the a uh, huge uh, gap of ocean costs and versus air costs. Uh, railway is already a very uh, strong alternative. And I believe it will even uh, be uh, growing faster, obviously in line with the uh, uh, investments of the capacity and a little bit more reliable uh, transit times is required as well as, uh, as far as we can see. I also would like to uh, maybe uh, give an uh, idea how the uh, supply chain and logistics can be flexible and dynamic. Uh, before pandemic, uh, until uh, February, uh, we had, and with several of our customers, we had an rail air intermodal. So we had several customers that uh, we were organizing with our forwarders, ex-China, with rail to Almaty, and from Almaty with air to Istanbul and Turkish Airlines hub to worldwide. So even rail air, uh, it becomes a kind of an intermodal solution for several customers who prefers something between uh, air and rail transport in terms of transit time and that if the cost uh, can match. Just to give you an idea how uh, supply chain solutions and logistics solutions Yeah is and should be dynamic and rail yeah. air is a uh, significant alternative i believe when it is more stabilized we will even have more volumes from our chinese customers uh, targeting and directing europe as a trans siberian railway from almata uh, transfer to turkish cargo network uh, especially for south of europe Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we can once again say to the organizers, it's not going to be the future battle between an air and ocean. It's much more complex uh, than, than just those two. Um, can we go to the next poll, please? Yes. Uh, we have the poll on the screen. So are companies tending to have more stocks? Eh? I think the whole just in time has, uh, has seen its limits and, and the issues it, uh, it has. Do you think that, uh, that we will see uh, more stocks just allowing also more time to refill stocks and uh, uh, supporting a shift from air to sea? Okay, 10 more seconds. Thank you very much. 
Mr. Seaman, we can have the results here. Yes, thank you very much. Um, there is a, a good majority, almost double, uh, people who are really believing that indeed uh, the logistics uh, mentality of, of a lot of companies will change with, uh, with bigger stocks uh, having an impact on, on air cargo. Um, Mr. Turan, um, that would be negative for the air cargo industry. Do you believe that this is a temporary or structural uh, possibility that this will happen? Uh, I believe uh, there will be a structural change, uh, more or less, we should agree. Uh, just in time, uh, production and fulfillment uh, continuous replenishment models uh, now learned that uh, they need a buffer, uh, a significant uh, uh, buffer uh, inventory or stock, either on transit or in the warehouses, uh, just to protect uh, themselves against any uh, threat like uh, COVID showed us. Uh, so that uh, certainly will be uh, an impact negative from air cargo perspective. Uh, the second is it's not only uh, having uh, more and longer uh, in transit uh, inventory, it's also about um, diversification of uh, sources, diversification of source countries and source bases. This is also uh, shown, uh, this crisis showed that the company, the countries uh, can unfortunately go to lockdown in a very few weeks because of such a pandemic. So many global organizations, uh, which are our customers at the end of our uh, air cargo or any logistics industry, uh, partner is uh, serving the final owners of the cargo and goods. These uh, multinational and or multi-market enterprises, I'm sure will uh, decide to diversify their supply base geographically further. This will also be another impact. Okay, Mr. Tanush, when you're talking to your stakeholders, customers, do you see the same trend that uh, the just-in-time will have an effect uh, on, on the maritime? Do you see other trends that might um, fundamentally change logistics, uh, just like, for example, the nearshoring, uh, but also insourcing uh, from big companies on their own logistics? How, how do you see the, the trend? Yeah, uh... Actually, uh, for a country like India, where uh, the logistics cost is already high uh, at the rate of around, I think, 14% of the GDP, and there has been a constant push from the government to bring it down to the 10%. And I don't think so. Uh, the you know uh, Going away from the just-in-time concept is uh, going to be a long-time measure. Yes, uh, it will be there for a short time as a crisis management step. But in the long term, I, I won't think because uh, of that, uh, the lo total logistics cost in India, 40% are indirect cost, which includes the inventory carrying cost. And going further to stockpiling is not a sustainable uh, thing to do uh, in the long term, I believe so. So I don't see the shift going uh, towards there. And with further improving the infrastructure uh, in the country, transportation infrastructure in the country, and uh, shift of the mo model from the road and railway to the waterways. I think more just-in-time inventory management will be the norm. But yes, it will take uh, the situations to come uh, normal, and it will take some time, maybe a year or two. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Mrs. Atish. How do you look at at it? Do you believe the 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 whole thing of the nearshoring, but also the, the the future possibilities of interest rates on stock levels? Uh, but also the fact that uh, a lot of companies, uh, especially when public uh, noted, uh, that logistics becomes suddenly a very visible and vulnerable part of your business. Uh, how, how do you think that companies will, will change their behavior or their attitude towards logistics? I think over the last uh, so many years, if you see, uh, the prominence of the logistics departments have increased drastically because the shelf lives of the product uh, have now become much shorter. People's expectation is that with the e-commerce and the rest of them coming in, what you expect is you press a button and the product is at your house. So in given that scenario, 
the whole dynamics of the supply chain have changed so drastically so as much as uh, the customer is willing to pay a higher price so you will continue see the air freight push constantly being there because when you want a product you, you don't worry about the price in, in most of the cases but whereas your raw materials and the rest of them uh, still will have to be really factored in properly and your for demand planning and forecasting will become very very critical for organizations at least for the raw material i know during covid all planning has gone here while now at this point of time but uh, the pharma companies have still survived for a reason is that they were holding a good amount of stock in terms of their apis and raw materials which even with the breakdown in china uh, the impact on the indian pharma industry was not very substantial in terms of completely collapsing which which is quite evident in terms of it the automotive industry undoubtedly cannot afford uh, air freight given the cost of the components are such low in terms of uh, india so that will remain a major area where we will still see the ocean freight impact uh, really being there the retail market uh, if you look at it is a white goods industry we've seen those have got cannot afford the air freight as well so there are a certain segments which will continue to go through ocean but customers demands are resulting in more air freight constantly happening as well so my take would be uh, as follows is that Uh, you will have to have a combination of both uh, in terms of co constantly pushing your volume on ocean but at the same time to meet the market demand a certain amount of quantity also goes through air which will then ideally make the supply chain department's uh, role you know really important in the organization because who reaches the market first is ultimately going to be you can't wait for a sanitizer and say look it's going to come in uh, in ocean freight for the next one month Uh, this is a reality that we all need to live with it if you want a mask today or a goggle today or a ppe you are not going to wait for it to come through ocean freight even if the cost is higher i think the the situation is that you will push it through air so so it's a it's an ideal combination of uh, demand and supply uh, right forecasting and then how you balance uh, your product and 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 as a result some of the products will go out of shelf because they can't afford the air freight at this point in time and this is the reality Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will ask again a question, looking a little bit into the future. I do realize nobody has a a glass ball and 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 knows the future, but I do think that you guys are very well placed to have a strong opinion on it. So maybe Turan, for you, um, with with the passenger business, and I think everybody agrees on that one. Uh, not back onto the 2019 figures before 2020. Three earliest. How do you see the future of freighters? Do you do you think we will do more freighters, uh, and that suddenly we see an uplift in freighters again? Do you see that, that there will be a stronger hub to hub connection because freighters they do demand uh, more capacity? But what's going to happen with the more point to point cargo destinations? Will we see more smaller freighters, or do you believe that? the way we operate freighters today using sometimes even passenger aircraft that this is going to be something that we will see longer than just a few months uh yes steve uh, first of all uh i believe hub and spoke uh, strategies will will be less uh, uh less points uh, international transport uh, airports coverage but with higher volumes in order to justify the use uh, of freighters efficiently uh so that's uh, one topic the second uh passenger uh, freighters uh, uh i i heard some professions now start to call it uh, uh, praters uh, rather than freighters praters the passenger freighters are now very common Uh, i was just writing to one of the questions uh, from our perspective we reached more than 150 flights per week 150 150 flights per week uh, just for uh, passenger uh, belly uh, use uh, passenger craft uh, full of cargo uh, flights Th these are typically uh, white body uh, fly uh, crafts b triple sevens dreamliners or airbus 330s with already having uh, significant capacity in their belly uh, 
uh, decks, uh, lower decks. Even the main deck use of uh, seat, uh, passenger seat uh, deck use of cargo uh, becomes, uh, although it's not dominant because in terms of flight safety and regulations, it requires uh, the boxes to be very light and just for dry and a typical textile kind of cargo. So it's not always very, very efficient to use the passenger main decks. I can say that we do up to 15 per week only. However, up to 150 uh, per week, uh, only uh, belly hold is full of cargo. Uh, passenger crafts are starting to uh, fly since now the first week of April uh, for Turkish uh, uh, Turkish cargo network. Uh, Turkish cargo before pandemic was able to reach to 310 destinations uh, and 127 countries due to passenger network and due to belly network. Now with all these uh, efforts using the passenger crafts, the total uh, destinations we are reaching is 105. So dropped from 330 to 105 and from 126, 127 countries to we are flying to uh, almost 80 countries. And it is still uh, probably the most extensive, the most extensive uh, cargo network of uh, worldwide the carriers uh, in terms of coverage, but still you can see how it is uh, shrinked just because we don't have uh, uh, passenger uh, flights, especially for narrow body passenger uh, capacity uh, destinations, uh, several, uh, several destinations in Middle East, uh, also in India, um, in Eastern Europe, uh, Central Asia, in Africa, which means that we cannot serve anymore. However, uh, specific to India, I should say that Indian government and civil aviation made a very uh, smart, uh, smartest decision very long time ago, I assume, I don't know when is it, uh, probably very long time ago, to have the Indian uh, sky as an open sky for freighters. So Indian market is an open sky for cargo freighters since a quite long time, as, as far as I know, it is like that. So what happens, it makes a huge capacity availability from any uh, worldwide uh, cargo uh, and freighter operators like Turkish cargo, like any others, uh, many others, uh, we are able to reach to several Indian uh, cities and uh, we are building a strong export capability and a very efficient and low cost import uh, availability to Indian customers uh, thanks to this open sky, uh, cargo open sky uh, ability. I can say that uh, we are flying to in total uh, six, seven uh, uh, cities uh, as Turkish cargo uh, by uh, 16 uh, uh, freighter uh, flight per week uh, frequency, which is quite significant. It's not only Bombay or uh, Delhi, it includes Ahmedabad, uh, Chennai, Hyderabad, and uh, Bangalore and uh, uh, some others. So this is also showing uh, from Indian market perspective, uh, the impact of uh, belly uh, cargo uh, drainage uh, shrink uh, impacted Indian um, market uh, less than uh, other countries. Whereas when we come to Europe, your, uh, uh, your home uh, uh, continent and also Turkey and several other uh, major markets are suffering more than 50% shrink of demand because belly cargo is not anymore there. Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Tanush, when we look at the maritime uh, and the trends, uh, uh, we saw a trend of ships always becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, which was leading to a lot of congestion in ports. Uh, the whole discussion of uh, uh, faster or slower steaming uh, what do you think that we will see? Will we see, uh, see, will we see again smaller ships coming up, uh, less depending on the big volumes? Uh, what do you think will happen? Uh, I think uh, I don't see small because uh, as the uh, logistics uh, goes more into the hub and spoke kind of uh, model, 
I I see more and more bigger ships uh, coming, especially in the container uh, uh, transportations. And uh, one uh, silver lining uh, among all this, what I see uh, among the crisis is the push for digitization, uh, which would further increase, uh, you know, the port operations efficiency. So which will enable faster cargo evacuation and faster turnaround times. So I think the overall uh, with the incoming of the bigger ships and the faster uh, cargo evacuation from the ports, the future of the uh, ocean logistics cost is going to drop, especially in uh, context of uh, India. And the government has been uh, trying, uh, you know, from a quite long time uh, to push for this digitization effort. And I think it will now even get more impetus in the coming uh, days, you will see. Okay, thank you. Great. Can I uh, ask the uh, organization for the next poll, please? Yes, please. I hope we have many, many people using their 15 seconds to answer. So uh, be ready. Yes. Here we go. Yes, Mr. Stephen, you'd like to read the question for the audience? Yes. So the question is very simple. Do you think that after this crisis, companies will do more in-house uh, when it comes to supply chain? Or do you think that they will more rely on specialized companies and further outsource these activities? Right. So please. Uh, 10 more seconds. Requesting everyone to participate, contribute. Thank you very much. The organizers didn't tell you, but the ones answering all six questions in time, I'm pretty sure they will get a discount on the next Air India event, Air Cargo India event. <laughs> all right. <laughs> so we see the results up here. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That's, uh, that's good. So I think that two thirds, almost two thirds believes uh, that people will rely even more on the competence uh, of, of logistics companies uh, rather than uh, strengthening their own um, resources. So despite the problems they are facing today, they do believe that uh, the solution should come from these uh, logistics companies. Um, when you read this, uh, Mr. Satish, that, that should sound good for you. Surely, yes. Is that what you feel as well, talking to your customers already, that, that they feel that, uh, that, that they trust more indeed your knowledge, competence, network than, than they can do themselves, although the crisis? Absolutely. I, I think uh, if you look at it over the last uh, 20 years, the mindset of the customers has changed drastically. As much as the freight forwarders also have realized the importance to know the business of the customers much better which is something which has actually, you know, helped uh, both the ways, uh, you know, the customer benefited because for them to scale up their operations became much easier, especially if you look at specific verticals like pharma, the customers have uh, really moved from an in-house model into an outsourced model, uh, surely, uh, because what they realize is their com core competence is really to focus now on making the medicine available and the patient safety is the most important thing. If you look at the current scenario that uh, the world is in today, I think it is ideal for the pharma companies to really focus on producing the medicine and saving the lives, then trying to break their head on how to you know, run the logistics because uh, the dynamics in the logistics is changing so rapidly that today uh, Turan is here on the thing. The flight schedules are no more summer schedules than winter schedules. The schedules are restricted to probably a monthly, weekly sort of a thing to maintain that type of uh, the shipping lines themselves are coming up with uh, a lot of schedules being reworked and blank sailings. So it is ideal for them uh, to also look at partners who have expertise in terms of technology, in terms of handling of your documents, in terms of custom knowledge, and they surely focus on the core area of their business. Which, will, which is a win-win situation because with economies of scale coming for the service providers, it becomes easy for us to service the customer and uh, invest more infrastructure, in, uh, train more people, build that relevant competency in terms of getting into GDP certification, CIB Pharma, you know, for that particular vertical. I think the, the way forward also is collaboration not competing with uh, you know multiple layers of uh, creation uh, within the industry 
So that that will be my answer, uh, Stephen. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Interesting. Um, when we go forward, and I think that uh, okay, we. we one day the world will look more normal again, or at least what we think is normal, uh, but we will see some changes. Uh, from each of you perspective, eh, I know there is uh, concerns on staff, availability of staff, the global economy. If I would ask you your two main concerns for the rest of the year uh, in dealing with these challenges uh, or the, the biggest problems you are facing, what would it be for each of you in your specific company or, or environment? Uh, and I would like to start with you, Mr. Turan. Thank you, Steve. First of all, uh, this uh, pandemic uh, situation certainly uh, creates uh, one of the most uh, challenging uh, recession in the uh, world economy. And uh, we are just uh, at the beginning of this. Uh, I certainly hope uh, it will be uh, easy however uh, most probably it will be one of the biggest uh, contraction and recession in uh, global uh, economy uh, for this year or maybe uh, for the first part of the next year and eventually uh, the global uh, demand for air cargo in line with uh, decreases in uh, consumptions and in line uh, with decreases in uh, production in several important sectors uh, because of this uh, economical uh, contractions uh, the demand of uh, air cargo will drop as well in 2019 uh, we and, and since uh, last quarter of 2018 now one and a half year uh, global air cargo demand was already contracting in, in, in single digits but was, was already contracting so unfortunately in 2020 and maybe uh, early 2021, uh, we foresee that the demand of air cargo, even though the urgent shipments, uh, medicals, pharmas, will create an additional uh, support to this demand, demand. however, in, in total, uh, the demand for air cargo uh, will decrease, maybe in double digits. Unfortunately, uh, uh, this is our uh, projections. We, I, I pray that it is not, uh, it won't be too severe, but uh, to be to be objective and to be ready for the future, to get ready for the future, uh, we try to make uh, strong uh, scenarios and uh, pre 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 predictions, uh, projections, and these scenarios and projections mostly cover uh, a double-digit. Uh, uh, shrink scenarios in uh, in global air cargo demand. So this is the main concern. So we have to uh, survive and compete uh, in a, a decreasing demand environment for the uh, next 12 months or so on and so forth. And the second part is very much related to our industry uh, business structure, which is uh, passenger side. Uh, when we talk about airlines, also many stakeholders like uh, airports, uh, like um, uh, handling organizations. Uh, the majority of the business so far has always been uh, depending on uh, passenger uh, business. So airline industry has a bigger uh, uh, source, which is passenger, and uh, let's say a smaller, a relatively smaller uh, source of income, which, is, which was cargo. Uh, this uh, will shift totally However, uh, this shift will make a lot of uh, uh, challenges to overcome. Uh, maybe the new passengers network will be more dependent on cargo uh, demands. Maybe new kind of uh, conversion, converted uh, aircrafts, which has more uh, cargo capacity, but less, and uh, spared uh, seat capacity uh, will be uh, will be valid. Uh, I remember of combi models of the past. Maybe we, we may have some new combi models. Obviously, the regulators uh, and the uh, producers, manufacturers uh, will eventually find a way to best optimize between less and more space demand of passengers and more uh, demand of uh, more accumulation of cargo between the hubs. So this changes between passenger and uh, cargo dynamics uh, in the same industry 
uh, will be the second important challenge that uh, we have to overcome. And each airlines have different uh, passenger and uh, cargo uh, perspectives. That's why it will be difficult uh, from different aspects for several airlines to balance the, the new best balance, to find the new best balance between uh, cargo plus uh, passenger uh, demand and total revenues so that in their, under such a difficult conditions, uh, any uh, airline can generate uh, and profitably generate a necessary revenue to run a specific flight from A to B and B to A. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Thank you very much. Thanks. And and I do like the idea of maybe seeing a kind of a new version of a combi aircraft <laughs> in the skies. That would be interesting. Uh, and I think that uh, the expression uh, "prepare for the worst and hope for the best" uh, fits your strategy and the first part of your story very well. Huh? Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Tanush. What are you two uh, main concerns or biggest challenges uh, to come out of this COVID uh, situation to a more new normal? Uh, first of all, uh, uh, with respect to, uh, as you asked uh, earlier, the staff shortages, uh, when the lockdown was announced in India, uh, ports uh, employer presence dropped uh, to 8 to 10 percent, uh, despite being ports declared as uh, essential services. Now that situation has really improved. Now the average employee attendance has gone up to 70 percent. Uh, in fact, uh, some ports has nearly 90 percent attendance, uh, which includes uh, staff of port authorities, terminal operators, and other uh, supporting services. And as far as uh, the future concerns are, uh, <coughs> future is concerned, I see uh, for this year there is definitely going to be a drop in the total uh, traffic or the total uh, volume handled at the ports and. This could be uh, anywhere uh, in, the, in the range of 10 to 20 percent. And but uh, in a year or so uh, for the next financial year, maybe once the situation gets uh, better, uh, normal and depending on the other uh, global situations uh, vis a vis related to the, uh, you know, uh, war, uh, uh, regulation war between China and US. The, Overall cargo uh, traffic I see uh, that will come up uh, may not uh, be to the uh, earlier uh, growth rate of 6 to 7%, but there will be some improvement, I believe. So. Okay, thank you very much. And then lately, but last but not least, Mr. Satish, what are your two main uh, concerns, challenges to overcome? Let, let me make it more specific in reference to India because uh, a lot of our audience are from India and if you look at India with all its 28 states and the nine union territories that we have currently now, uh, earlier prior to COVID, no one was worried to work in any other state without any other difficulty. Uh, someone born in Haryana still would go and work in Kerala or someone born in Kerala and each state had its own capabilities in terms of the talent. Uh, someone from Bihar was highly talented in, in some part of the business and versus someone in Maharashtra had other set. The people from the South were good in doing it. But post-COVID, uh, what we are going to see is that everyone would want to be remain in his home state, which means there will be a shortage of great amount of talent. And uh, as we speak, there are lacks of migrant labor now stuck in Gujarat, uh, struggling to get back to their home states. So this will be a major area where the industry is going to face a major, major setback of uh, labor that uh, would be. So this will be one uh, concern area which every government will have to address. The second concern that uh, which uh, Turan would also appreciate is that the Indian population is the largest population, which basically means today you would get onto a flight uh, which has say 100 people and you are bound to see 20 of them to be Indians, unfortunately, that is the truth and reality. Whether you go to US, you go to any part of the world of it. Today, in the new restrictions that are coming from the geopolitical war type of a scenario, with each government coming up with some sort of a restrictions on visa, on travel, and the rest of them, the travel will reduce drastically, uh, holidaying will reduce drastically. As a result, the passenger flights are bound to go much more emptier. The much more they go empty, the likelihood that the airlines will drop on those routes which are non-profitable. And the moment they drop those routes which are non-profitable, the price of the cargo is bound to increase substantially. And, and this is an important area which uh, probably people don't have now the time to really think about it much.
but i think it's an it's a thought to ponder is that uh, the geopolitics of these wars to not lead to larger restrictions in the long term currently it's acceptable but i think in the long term it's important that if the economy has to come back to some level of decency uh, some bit of restrictions will have to uh, be lifted as well. so these are my two concerns uh, basic okay thank you very much uh, i try to uh, to include as many questions from the audience in my different questions but there are too many that we got up front and uh, during the session to answer them all uh, uh, so i'm sorry mr steven uh, there are yes. few people who would like to ask live question if time okay. permits can we take it up yeah for me that's no problem if that's uh, an option yes please all right so we have mr mohammed daniel uh mr mohammed daniel you would like to ask a question to any of the panelists please i think he's still on mute uh, yeah but uh he's unable to unmute himself okay we go to mr uh, sajal mr sajal nath you would like to ask a question to any of the panelists he is also muted uh can you unmute him i tried doing that but uh, i think from the, from the other side it's not happening but we have mr matru uh, bhutan bhutan yeah. yes sorry yeah he is from chennai airport maybe you want to unmute him and mr matru uh, bhutan you would like to ask any question to the panelist unfortunately we could not uh, go that way okay all right uh, in that case uh, do we have mr steven do we have any final questions for the panelist or shall we close it at this stage no. sorry do we have any uh, steven has another conference as well as do i yes, have yes yes oh, that really? was the id so because we, we, we uh, jump in from one to the other so yeah, oh, yeah. Really. we are short of time unfortunately so okay i have so answered as many questions as possible online uh, otherwise people can be more than happy to reach out to me uh, for one to one uh, yeah sure uh, i also see, i also saw some questions directed to me uh, if uh, the organization I, you have my email uh, so if you can share with the participants i will be happy to uh, answer them as well perfect Perfect. Thank you very much. And for those who have questions on pharmaceuticals and pharma transportation, at one o'clock the webinar uh, organized by Stat Media Times and Pharma.iro is specifically about pharmaceuticals and air cargo. So if your question was not answered in this webinar, then for sure you can try it again in 15 minutes and log in on that one, and maybe your question will be answered on that one. I thank very, all the panelists very much uh, for their participation, their views. and their time and i would like to hand over back to to mr tarun from the organization thank you very much uh good evening everybody thank you very much mr uh, stephen and uh, mr satish mr tanoj and mr turan it was a real pleasure to have you on board uh, and having such a important and a uh, such a insightful discussion for everybody uh we will be very happy to have you on board once again for our next uh, webinars again uh, for for now thank you very much take care stay safe and healthy bye 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 thank you very much thank you everyone take care thank you thank you thank you everyone